Yeah, Friday! Welcome to the Ranting Weight Watcher Podcast. The future number one weight loss podcast in the world. I am your host, Donato Russo. I hope you enjoy the show today. If this is your first time here and you enjoy the show, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. If the podcast app you're listening on allows you to rate the show, please leave a four-star or five-star rating. Any rating is greatly appreciated. This is episode 87. I got a packed show for you, so let's not waste any time, and let's get into this. journey updates we had a good week this week guys down 1.2 pounds so the gain from last week is gone with a little bit extra we are down for the month of april a total of 4.4 pounds so far total lost since january 2019 is 145 pounds Pounds remaining to get to the milestone goal of 150 is 5 pounds. Pounds remaining to get to the milestone goal of 175 is 30 pounds. And the pounds remaining to get to the 200-pound milestone, 55 pounds. It has been a crazy ride. I, I, it has taken a lot longer to get to 150 than I wanted it to. But it is what it is. I can't go back and change anything. All I can do is edit things going forward. Maybe if I knew that this diabetic thing would have helped me, maybe I could have done it sooner. Or maybe this was just the time I was supposed to do it. I don't know. I can't honestly tell you. But speaking of the diabetic experiment... So we had a plan for the last, for the what I called phase four, which was week seven, eight, and nine of the experiment. And that plan was to bring Sunday's point usage down to within my points, okay? So right now I've been using activity points on Sundays, and I don't want to use activity points on Sundays I, I'm okay with using them Saturdays because I go out and have a good time, whatever. But Sunday, it can't not be both days. It could be one or the other. It cannot be both. So we are working hard to get Sunday within the point range. Although when I made this plan, I didn't take into consideration that the next two weeks, basically the first two weeks of phase four, week seven and week eight of the experiment, We're going to be Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, which my family celebrates. And, you know, a typical Italian dinner is served. And there's a lot of extra things, especially some of my favorite things in the world, like appetizers. I will take appetizers all day over the entire meal. That's something you need to know about me. Those appetizers are some of my favorite things on the planet. God forbid if... Antipasto stuff was in my house all year round. And if it wasn't just for holidays, I would not be nearly as successful as I am today had those things be constantly in my house. But anyway, (laughs) um, these things were served on these first two weeks of phase four. Kind of throwing off the whole idea but because these were big holiday meals there was no lunch and the original plan was to bring down lunch to basically a zero point lunch over the three weeks so we just shifted it so now instead of week seven eight and nine being the time period where we're going to give ourselves to 
bring down Sunday to within its point value. We're just going to do it for the rest of the experiment. Weeks 9, 10, 11, 12, the last four weeks of the experiment, we are going to bring Sunday to within the point value. I'm just taking my time with it, experimenting. I don't want to feel like I'm uh, giving up too much too quick kind of a thing. I want to go through each thing and see if something can be substituted so I don't feel hungry versus eliminated. That's the idea. I have taught, I have spoken about this many times in the past. And I, I bring up the idea of what I call breaking chains. Every single one of us has chains. And these chains are attached to anchors, specific moments in our past where something happened that caused a traumatic event, whatever it is. And if you turn to food in these moments, or whatever you may have turned to, but in, in, in my case, it's going to be food. If you turn to food in these moments, this is where emotional eating begins. Something bad happens, and you start to turn to food for comfort for that bad thing. So previously, this episode on the podcast was the March 12th, 2021 episode. I had spoken about wanting to get to 277. Now, if you're new here, I'll do it quickly. I was 460 pounds in 2004. Decided that gastric bypass was the answer to all of my problems. I got the gastric bypass at the end of 2004. So from October 2004 to, I want to say, around summer or September-ish. So like summer or end of summer 2005. Just about a year. I went from 460 pounds to 277 pounds. I then, at that moment, slowly but surely, became extremely comfortable in my success. There was no urgency whatsoever. I became extremely relaxed and extremely indulgent in things. I was caught up in rewarding myself. Call it the beginning of probably the longest reward cycle of anybody's life. Because that's the kind of things we do. We decide we want a healthy lifestyle. So we dive in head first and we do whatever is necessary. We find some sort of success. We get a level of success that starts to bring comfort. And then we start to relax. So now because of the gastric bypass surgery, I had found a level of success that I never once found. So when we hit this level of success, the comfort we feel in that success clouds our judgment, causing things to go in the wrong direction. Basically, simply said, it's self-sabotage. And you're too blind in your success to see you're sabotaging yourself. And if people start to point it out to you, if they actually have the the guts it takes to point something out like that to you, knowing you've had this success, you, you meet their criticism with scorn, which I met criticism with excuses, not scorn. But in the same token, it began the longest re- reward cycle. And that's where when we hit that level of comfort, we start rewarding ourselves for our hard work. And we become comfortable in rewarding ourselves, never realizing you're ruining your success because of this celebration. Now, for some people, the reward cycle doesn't last that long because it depends, really, when does the level of comfort begin? Now, I I have also said before, in previous attempts on Weight Watchers and other systems, I had said that I would hit the 20-pound mile, you know, the 20-pound loss, people would start congratulating me. It's like they would notice right away. You hit the 20-pound mark, people notice you lost 20 pounds. 
And the 20 pound mark was always the mark where I then began to sabotage. So it doesn't take long to return to zero when you start to sabotage at 20 pounds lost. So in, in, a, in the year time that I went from being post-op, I went from, two, from 460 to 277. So in the one year time, that one year, that first year post-op, I went from 460 pounds to 277 pounds. And there began the longest, biggest reward cycle of anyone's life, not just mine. I became extremely comfort in my success. No one could tell me otherwise, like, oh, you know, I'm just on a plateau. I'm on a plateau. That's all there is to it. In reality, here's the reality of it. I lost almost 200 pounds, about 13 pounds away from losing 200 pounds. And in that time period, I changed nothing. My habits did not change one bit. The only thing that changed was the amount of food that I can ingest. But here's the one thing many people don't really talk about when it comes to gastric bypass. If you eat a lot of food, eat, okay, let's, let's say even less than that. If you take really big bites and you don't chew thoroughly, the food you're sending down into this small stomach makes you feel full right away. And sometimes, like for me, it's extremely painful to do that. So in these moments where I did not chew well and sending it and creating all kinds of pain for myself, I did not stop myself from eating. Instead, I sat and said, hey, I'm eating too fast. And I would wait. Eventually, I don't know, say 10, 15, 20 minutes later, the pain would subside because the food would start to pass into the intestine. At this point, the pain would subside and I would be able to technically eat more of my food. I also subconsciously learned I could eat more if I ate slowly and more thoroughly, like if I chewed more thoroughly. So instead of eating the typical amount of food that you're supposed to eat, because I manipulated the situation, which anybody who has had gastric bypass can do, they, they can slow down. So where in the beginning I could only eat a quarter of a Big Mac, then I, I start to realize if I eat slower, I don't ever feel that over full feeling. And all of a sudden it's half the Big Mac. And I'm manipulating it even further and taking long because when you go out with friends, you tend to be out at the restaurant for hours. You don't tend to be there for minutes and leave. It's not like you're there by yourself. So while we're sitting there BSing for two, three hours, I'm taking my time with my food. And before I know it, the whole Big Mac is going down. Now, is one Big Mac less than I was eating when I was 460? Absolutely. Absolutely. Believe it or not, it is much less. At 460 pounds, I would pull into a Burger King or a McDonald's. I would get the number four supersize, which is double what? Double quarter pounder supersize. Or I'd get the double Whopper meal from Burger King. Then I would go to a 20-piece nugget on the side with the French fries. And then for the ride home, at Burger King, I'd throw a double cheeseburger in the bag. At McDonald's, I'd throw a Big Mac in the bag. So while I'm driving home, I would eat the Big Mac or the double cheeseburger. Then I got home, and you could bet that the entirety of everything, the 20-piece nugget, the supersized fries, and the burger would all have been eaten. So yes, it was a significant caloric intake difference post-op than pre-op, which is what caused the huge amount of weight loss but I didn't change the behavior. That the, What should have happened is I should have stopped choosing McDonald's. Not to say you can never eat McDonald's again, but it should not be a daily or a, it should not be a regular thing, period. Let's, let's just say it. Come on. Uh, oh, you don't come at me saying, oh, you can't tell people what they can and can't eat. Let's just be real here. There are certain things that if you want to say you're on a healthy lifestyle, they cannot be part of your daily regimen. And if you actually believe that, you're still in the delusion. Go away, come back in a year or two when you're ready to hear my voice. 
Because that's going to be the only way you're going to get, I'm going to get through to you. When you're caught up in the delusion that you can still eat what you want on a daily basis and manage to lose weight, especially when the things that you want have zero health benefit. They don't have anything your body needs. It's just pleasure to the tongue. That's really what it is. When it becomes fuel for the body, it is the worst fuel you could possibly give your body. And your body takes what it can take from it and, and dumps the rest. Let's just say it for what it is. What we have to realize is we can't make regular occurrences like this. We can't make it so that this is happening on a regular basis. Once I, when I got to 277, I went way back up over the next 15 years. And that's why I, I call it the longest reward cycle because I became so comfortable. And then I became ignorant. I started to ignore the obvious signs that I had gained a, min, a, a minimum of 50 pounds. And when people called me out on it, I'm like, no, 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 this is the weight I've, I've been for months. It's like I'm maintaining, I used to say. Knowing that it, that wasn't the case. There's no way it was the case. And before I knew it, 15 years later in 20, uh, 2018, I find myself as close to 460 as I'm going to allow myself to get. I was 396, and it was about a month or two before my birthday, and I started to realize what the hell did I do to myself. So that number, 277, became a chain on my life. And everything was about getting back there because that was what I achieved in one year. Now I had to get back there. So I started January 2019 and I broke the chain March 12th, 2021. A little over two years later, I broke the chain, made it back and surpassed the 277 mark for the first time in 15 years. In the episodes that lead up to this one on March 12th, I reflected a lot. I reflected on childhood, I reflected on young adulthood, whatever. All kinds of things that happened in my life. And I thought about a lot of other chains on my life that had to do with bullying and various other things that I had to break. We're going to talk about that after the break. Don't go anywhere. Hello, I'm Donato Russo, and I am the Ranting Weight Watcher. I wrote an affirmation. It's called the Ranter's Creed. I dedicate that affirmation to all of you who are watching. Nothing can stand in your way because you are an unstoppable force. Your challenges crumble in your presence because you are so strong. Your insecurities no longer have power over your life because you are so confident. Your mistakes are your choices and you are okay with this because you are so intelligent. The mirror and the scale no longer haunt you because you are so beautiful. You can face any circumstance with unwavering support because you are so loved. The demons of your past can no longer torment you because you love yourself. All things are possible as long as you believe because God is on your side. You will achieve all of your goals, not if, but when, because you have no boundaries. You are the champion of your story because you do whatever it takes to win. No one can take what you've done away from you 
because you are the author and the hero of your story. Arise, champion. The victory is yours. Because you are enough. We are back. Thanks for sticking with me. So I talked about the breaking of the chains, the anchors of our past, the traumatic moments in our lives where things go wrong and we turn to something to give us comfort. Now, for a lot of us, if you're hearing the sound of my voice, for a lot of us, that's going to be food. For some of us, it'll be alcohol. For some of us, it'll be drugs, cigarettes, so on. There are a million different things you could become addicted to. And these addictions happen because of seeking comfort. And you nurture the behavior because when you go to, go to these items and they provide comfort, your brain remembers this. There's a connection made. Oh, the last time you had tr- something traumatic happen... There was a piece of chocolate cake in the fridge that made you feel so much better. So the next time there's a traumatic event, what do you do? If there's not a piece of chocolate cake in the fridge, you're going somewhere where you can buy a piece of chocolate cake or you can buy a whole chocolate cake. Or you can buy the mix to make a chocolate cake. Either way, your brain is going to remember that chocolate cake was the remedy that fixed you the last time. So besides the 277 anchor on my life, there were a couple of others. In previous episodes, I talk about these, and I mentioned that they're in the eighth grade. I don't think it's the eighth grade. So let's say seventh grade. But in the beginning of my middle school life, I had two things happen that were so memorable that they still kind of haunt me to this day. One rarely haunts me because I rarely see the item, but it haunts me enough from memory. On one of the first days of school, I decided at lunchtime that I wanted something extra with my lunch. So I got in line and they used to have these I, wanted the, I want to say the company's called Linders or Lindman's or Lind, uh, something like that. They, it starts with an L. You got a package of cookies, and there were three cookies, and I want to say it was a dollar in the cafeteria. So they had three different kinds. They had chocolate chip. They had butter crunch, which kind of tasted like butterscotch, and then they had double fudge. So that day in particular, I wanted the double fudge. So I go back to my desk with my package of three cookies and probably made the biggest mistake of my life. As you know, my name is Don. So it only took one kid to realize that Don bought double fudge cookies. And Don is also fat already at this time. So Don became double fudge Don. And I was called that for, God, months, months and months. Whenever they felt to bring it back up again. But even worse than that, I want to say this was right around the end. I don't remember doing it again after this incident. But they used to have the state-mandated fitness tests where they make you sit on your butt on the floor with your legs out in front of you and there's something in front of your feet where you have to put your hands one on top of the other and lean forward and push the pin forward 
and whatever other things they made you do. Climb the rope, you know, all this and that. A bunch of different activities. But one of those activities was you had to get weighed and, and your height and weight. And I'll never forget this day because this day, it was like, I don't know. To me, maybe, it was, maybe it's my memory of it just exaggerating it. I don't know. But in my mind, the gym teacher that was heading all this up spoke a little louder to the person that was helping him when I stepped on the scale. Because in the seventh grade, when I stepped on that scale, I stepped on that scale and it measured 253 pounds. So that's where we are. When he saw the number, he said it loud enough for the entire class to hear it. This is a chain on my life. Well, I didn't realize it, but just a few weeks ago, on April 2nd, I broke the chain on my life. I was 250 pounds, three pounds less, and I broke the chain of that moment in my life. Today, as I speak to you, I can say that I weigh less than I did in the seventh grade. Maybe to you this isn't a big deal because I'm still 250 pounds and I have a long ways to go. But for me, this is a big deal. To be able to say I'm more healthy at 44, or I should say I weigh less at 44 than I did in the seventh grade. This to me is a tremendous accomplishment. It's so important to identify these moments like this because what, they may seem ex- insignificant, but they are the core in some ways of what you do, your behaviors. These traumatic events in our lives, especially when we turn to food to solve them, to comfort them, These are the moments where we have to win back. We have to take, we have to attack the core. Get back to what caused this behavior in the first place. And I'm telling you, if you could manage, if you can say today that you're an emotional eater, and if you can manage to identify Anchor moments, moments where a chain was attached to your life. Because I'm not saying there's only one. For many of us, there's going to be many. Because once you learn that food gives you comfort, it only just takes the next traumatic event for you to turn to food again. It doesn't even have to be traumatic. It just has to be an event. Something didn't go your way. A circumstance in your life. You can't pay bills. Whatever it is. When you have these extreme moments and the food worked for the extreme moments, what makes you think you're going to be able to say no when you're stressed out because you can't pay bills? What makes you think you can say no when you're at work and you're facing a deadline and you're stressed out because you don't think you're going to make the deadline and everything depends on you? What makes you think you're going to say no when your household depends on you? And you have so many things you have to get done. And who needs a ride to practice? Who needs a ride to music, some recital, whatever it is, dance recital. And who needs a meal cooked when they come home? And you're juggling. You're juggling and you're juggling and you're stressed out. How are you going to say no to the one thing that always gave you comfort? The one thing that gave you comfort in the double fudge Don moment. The one thing that gave you comfort in the... 253 moment. How would you say no? You won't. Your brain remembers those moments and it is it learned a long time ago what made those moments feel better. And they're deeply ingrained. And the only way, the only way to fix them once and for all is to identify them, number one, and make a goal in regards to them. 
these moments in my life, I, I don't know how to defeat the double fudge Don moment. I don't know if it'll ever happen. But these other moments where the 277 and 253 moments of my life, they are scale moments. So it was easy to make them a scale result or a scale goal and go after them. Maybe talking about the moment, if you identify it, is what's required to break it. I can't answer that. I'm just thinking out loud here. For everybody, their solution is going to be different than mine. Just because something worked for me doesn't mean it's going to work for anybody else. We have to do something. It cannot stay the way it is. The chains that attach to these anchors will always hold us from where we want to go. The one thing I could say about them is the more success you achieve, the less power they have. You know, so many of us that are in my position where they were overweight the majority of their life, we spend totals of countless hours daydreaming about that moment where we can say we are at the goal weight we've always dreamed to be at. Now, a small percentage of us, a very small percentage, actually make it to that number. We make it to that number and we can say we did what we set out to do. But the majority of us, the majority of us never actually make it. Not because we can't. Because we won't. We won't do the actual work required to do what we say we want to do. Now, that being said, if you would have come to me in 2019 and said, Hey, Don, if you take the next three years and work really hard, you'll be able to tell the world that you weigh less than you did in the seventh grade. I would have told you you're out of your mind. It just seems so far-fetched. And you know what? The majority of the goals I had seemed far-fetched. When they didn't seem so far-fetched anymore was the day that my studio coach, Terry, handed me the 100-pound milestone charm. All of the sudden, everything seemed possible. And then she handed me the 125-pound charm, and everything seemed even more possible. And now here I sit, five pounds away, from the 150 pound milestone charm. And she may not be the one to hand it to me, and that's okay. But I will be three quarters of the way to the biggest goal I've ever set for myself in this journey. And you know what? I don't care how much work it takes. I'm going to get the 200 pound charm. Even if it kills me. I love each and every one of you. God bless you all.